Are you seeking fulfillment for your life? Do you want freedom from fear? That's why we're here. Welcome to Jesus 101, introducing you to the real Jesus. And now, here's your host, Elizabeth Talbot. Welcome to Jesus 101. We continue our study of Matthew, and you might be wondering what I'm wearing. Well, I'm wearing my past. You know, all of us have some stains we really would like somebody to come and just take away. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like somebody to say, okay, well, we know you have a past, but we're going to give you a brand new past. Well, today I want to talk to you about one of the main premises of the Gospel of Matthew. Perhaps you didn't know this, but he wants to tell Israel that Jesus is actually reliving their story and is being victorious everywhere where they failed. And that if they accept Jesus Christ, well, they actually get a brand new past without any of these. And he will do it so interestingly that I think you will find today's lesson actually very exciting. So I invite you to join me as I take my past off, <laughs> and we are actually going to go to Matthew chapter 4. Now, if you remember, we discussed the fact that Matthew is working with two main premises, and today we're going to talk about the third premise. And the third premise is the one I just gave you. So the first one is Jesus is the Davidic king we've been waiting for. Number two is um, he is the greater Moses that was to come. And number three is that Jesus relives Israel's history and is victorious where they failed. So let me take you to one of the stories where this becomes most evident, and it's Matthew chapter 4, the story of the temptations of Jesus. Okay, so let's go there. Now there's a little trick for today's lesson. You need to keep your hands in two places in the Gospel of, actually one place in the Gospel of Matthew and one in another book of the Bible so that we can really see what Matthew is doing by referring back to Israel's history and showing that Jesus is going again through the same thing. It shows that he does it right while they did it wrong. Now let's start with Matthew chapter 4 and open your Bibles in the book of Deuteronomy. So you're going to do both places at the same time. And this is the way it's going to work. We're going to read a little part in Matthew 4, and we're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy. So we're mainly going to stay in one section, chapter 6 to chapter 8. Okay, so we're ready? All right. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is going to the desert, and he will be tempted there. So we're going to read Matthew's introduction, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. Did you hear that? All the key words we just read. Let's read it one more time. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. Now let's go to the book that we decided to compare this with, which is the story of Israel. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we're going to start reading in verse 2. See how many key words you see that are here too. You shall remember all the way which the Lord God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you. He humbled you, verse 3, and let you be hungry. Wow, there's so many words in common. Matthew has put the introduction specifically so that you remember what Israel went through. We have the same words like wilderness and led you and 40 and hungry. And if you actually keep going, you will find many more because Matthew has done this very deliberately so that you know that Jesus is going back to what Israel went through. Let's keep reading. So verse three of chapter four of Matthew, the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter eight, and we're going to pick it up exactly where we left it. He humbled you, 
verse 3, and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Wow, Jesus was quoting that very verse. The one that Matthew prepared in the introduction so that you may know really that Jesus is going through what Israel went through. Wouldn't it be awesome if you came to believe that not only Jesus' death is, is put in your place, but also his perfect life? That somebody comes with an eraser and takes all those things out of your past and all of a sudden God sees you with like a perfect past, a brand new past. Well, let's continue reading in Matthew 4. Then the devil, verse 5, took him into the holy city and had his stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he starts quoting scriptures to Jesus. But Jesus that doesn't follow because he doesn't listen to the devil. <laughs> and he answers this on verse 7. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, this is also a verse from the same section that we are in, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus is still quoting from the same area. And then we continue. And the devil said, took him to a very high mountain, chapter 4, verse 8, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Well, you got it. That's also a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. You shall fear only the Lord your God and worship him only. See, what Matthew is trying to tell Israel is that, yes, they had quite a few failures as a nation. Yes, they had quite a few things that they could have done much better. And yes, they have a past that doesn't look too good. When they're wearing that past, well, you know, all those things are showing. Actually, they tested the Lord many times. They, in the 40 years, they actually many times said, well, is God with us or not? And so when Israel looks at its own history, exactly in the way we do sometimes, we look at our own history and we say, wow, I would love to have a brand new robe. Wouldn't you? Well, I would. Except that I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior and it's not just his death that I accepted on my behalf. I have accepted his perfect life in my place. I have accepted his perfect obedience. And, and, and the days that I, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it, those are the days that I just look for a week in Jesus' life and I place it on myself instead of mine. This is the robe of righteousness of Christ. And then all of a sudden you look at yourself and you see how God sees you because God sees you through the perfect life of Jesus Christ. This is the reason why in the New Testament, we're told that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, not only because he paid our transgressions, but because he lived a perfect life on our behalf. Well, wouldn't you like to have a brand new past? Well, I'll tell you what, if you accept Jesus Christ as a personal savior, this is his gift to you. You get a brand new past, one that has no mourning and no death, and no tears, and no sin. This is His robe of righteousness. You're watching Jesus 101. Welcome back to Jesus 101. I am still wearing my past. Remember that we were talking in our previous segment about the fact that, well, all of us have stains, and we would like somebody to come along and just take them from us. But Matthew is making a proposal, and Matthew's proposal is that, well, Jesus has lived a perfect life instead of Israel. And many times he quotes Jesus doing things that Israel used to do. For example, in chapter 2, when Jesus comes back from Egypt, Matthew says, well, that was to fulfill what the prophet has said, out of Egypt I call my son. Well, of course, that original verse had to do with Israel in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Out of Egypt, I call my son. But now the son was no longer Israel. It was the actual son of God. And he was reliving 
the life of Israel, and he was doing it right. His robe was perfect. His obedience was right. And every place where actually Israel had failed, well, Jesus was being victorious. And we already seen on Matthew chapter 4 how Matthew has narrated the whole temptation account in a way that you know that he's going exactly through the same things that Israel went through. It's just that he was being victorious where they had failed. Wouldn't you like to get that type of message in your life? Yeah, you know that one week that you don't want anyone to know about? I remember a week that I don't want anybody to know about. And so here we have Matthew not only telling um, Israel that the fact is Jesus lived a perfect life for them, but he's telling us the same thing. And he records a parable that is quite different than many of the other parables that the Gospels record. This is Matthew chapter 22. And again, we find a robe. It's interesting because at that time in that society, when, when you had a feast, well, you gave the robe. <laughs> you know, you didn't have to worry, what am I going to wear? And I'm sure all of you women out there know exactly what I'm talking about. What am I going to wear? Well, you were invited, so you were given a robe. Now, let's start reading chapter 22, verse 2. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now, don't forget Matthew always says kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God because the Jews didn't say the name of God. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited. But all these people had excuses. You know, in many ways, Jesus is talking about the fact that the Jews no longer wanted to be part of the kingdom. That God was saying to all those that he had invited originally, come in. But they said, no, we have, we're too busy. We have too many good things to do. And, and then the king was enraged, verse 7, chapter 22, verse 7. The king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set the city on fire. And then he said to the slaves, okay, we're going to fill up the wedding hall no matter what. The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So check this out, verse 9. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found. Don't forget that Matthew wants to say that east and west, and north and south, they're all going to come to the wedding feast, right? Well, the slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all all they found, both evil and good. I and mean, this is a strange little sentence. They gather everybody, evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. You know, they go to the homeless in the streets. Well, I'm sure those people wearing, wear, they were not really wearing anything nice. Uh, perhaps they didn't even have shoes. But of course, they're going to be given the garment. Verse 11. When the king came in to look over the dinner guest, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And my, why would somebody not be dressed in the wedding clothes that were given? Why? Why would anybody not put on the robe that the king gave? Well, maybe somebody that thinks that whew, their robe is nice enough. Maybe I don't need this perfect robe. My robe looks very nice. When the king came in to look over the dinner guest, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? But the man was speechless, you see, because if you are offered a wedding clothes and you don't take it, what are you going to say? Nobody told me. Nobody said so. How are you going to explain your pride that you thought that your dress was good enough? How are you going to explain the fact that well, I looked at myself and I thought it was pretty good. See, Matthew is talking to an audience that in some ways, they think they look pretty good. They have the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. They study. They can quote scripture by heart. They know the doctrines, but they miss Jesus. And it's, it's very difficult to understand that a person would not wear the wedding clothes that are given to them, right? Well, not really. 
This is a problem from Genesis to Revelation. When people look at themselves and they say, well, don't we look pretty good? And God says, no. <laughs> and we have a hard time understanding that the only reason why we will be standing in front of a holy God is not because our dress looks nice. Oh no, our dress is filled with all these things. The reason why we're gonna be there is because well, there is another robe that is not really in your closet. It's the robe of righteousness of Christ that really comes perfect and it comes directly from the cross. That one doesn't have any of the things that our robe has. And Matthew wants to teach his audience that really they can rest at ease, that the wedding clothes that they're given are the wedding feast of the lamb. And the lamb has prepared white clothes for them. And the white clothes are those that have been washed in his blood. And that if they accept Jesus Christ, well, they're invited to the wedding feast. Matthew is really interested in us understanding this. I know some of us have weeks and days in our past that we would really like to erase. And today I want to invite you to pray with me. A prayer that you repeat after me. Ready? Dear Lord Jesus, I invite you today to be my savior. And I accept your death on my behalf. And I accept your life on my behalf. And I accept your robe of righteousness placed upon me. And now I know that I will see you face to face. In the name of him who gave us the robe, Jesus. Amen. If you pray a prayer of acceptance of Jesus' righteousness on your behalf, you can no longer say, well, I don't qualify, because it's true, you don't, and I don't either. And like Martin Luther said, when I look at myself, I don't know how I could ever be saved. But when I look at Jesus, well, <laughs> I don't know how I could ever be lost. Well, may you have that experience, the assurance of your salvation, because the robe you're wearing is His. You're watching Jesus 101. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Talbot, and this is Jesus 101. And we continue with our series on robes. Remember, we were talking about our own stained pasts. How many of us would like somebody to come and say, Oh, no, we can't see that. We don't really know that. Well, Matthew is trying to tell Israel that Jesus lived a perfect life in their place. And we have already gone through Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus goes exactly through the same things, goes to the wilderness and is hungry for 40 days instead of 40 years. And he does all things right. Actually, actually Matthew even tells a parable about what would it feel like when you have the right robe on, the one that is given to you, the one that you do not own, and that is not in your closet. Well, the truth is, this clothing business... Well, it's been there from Genesis to Revelation. I want to tell you a story of somebody that I read the other day. There was this man who decided to get a domain name with the name of a pope that might be the next pope. So what happened is the pope did come to power and this man phoned the Vatican, said, you know, I own the domain name with this pope's name. I would like to give it to you. And so they ask, well, how much? He says, no, I don't want money. I want absolution for a particular week in my life. And he actually gave the date. I think it was March or something like that. So and so of that year. You know, it makes you wonder what he did that week, right? Well, the truth is, all of us have had, all of us have had weeks like that, that we would like absolution for. In the Bible, there is God's clothing business versus our clothing business. Even from the beginning in Genesis, you know, Adam and Eve were clothed in this perfect 
clothing of light. It was their innocence. It was their perfection. But when they sinned, you know, they didn't have the clothing anymore. So instead of going to God and saying, we lost our perfect clothing. Could you please do something about it? Oh, no, no. They said, we can make up our own clothing, can't we? What do you say, Eve? Do you think we can go to the fig tree and get a few leaves? And this is what they do. <laughs> How ridiculous, isn't it? They, they made a dress out of fig leaves, like it could look anything like the robe of righteousness that they were wearing before. They thought they looked pretty good. But when God saw them, so, 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 what's going on? <laughs> Well, we realized we were naked. How did you know that? Well, we sinned. And from that moment on, all of scripture, are men trying to clothe themselves and God saying, no, 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 you can't. I'm the only one that has the actual robe. I can give you the robe. You got to ask me for it, but it doesn't belong to you. It's not in your closet. So throughout the the, the Bible, the whole Bible, we see these moments in which they're clothing issues. I mean, for example, Zechariah is one of the uh, last books of the Old Testament, and we have the high priest, you know, who should be pretty good because he's the high priest. Well, he goes to the presence of God, and Satan, well, is accusing him because that's what Satan always does. And, and uh, verse 2 of, of Zechariah 3, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Talking about Joshua. But Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. They were his own, but they were filthy, even though he was the high priest. And standing before the angel, and he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with festal robes. Throughout the Bible, God is always telling us your, your clothing does not qualify. Your clothing really does not qualify. See, it doesn't qualify because he has all these things. Because even if you don't think you're like a public sinner, like a prostitute or, or in the time of Jesus, a tax collector, even if you're not one of those people, hey, when was the last time you... When like 24 hours without getting angry with somebody or having lustful thoughts. You know, we all struggle with so many things. Our sinful natures constantly remind us that our robe doesn't qualify. But the truth is, when we get to the book of Revelation, there is a church that thinks that they look pretty good. You know, it's interesting because Laodicea used to have an industry of black wool. And God says, you think your garments look good? You say, I'm rich, I don't need anything? Revelation chapter 3. And God says, let me tell you what I see from this angle. And he says, you say, I'm rich, verse 17. I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Did I say naked? Yes, because in Revelation, we're still in the same place where we were in Genesis after we lost our perfection when we sinned. And we're still naked, exactly like Adam and Eve were. But then God says, verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire and white garments so that you may clothe yourself. And that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. See, we don't have any garment in our closet. Even if you're a religious person, even if the Holy Spirit is working in you, He's working in you for the glory of God, but not because you're going to look so good that you no longer need the robe of righteousness of Christ. So we, we get the mystery solved a little bit later on chapter 7, because see, there is a wedding coming. Remember the wedding feast that we spoke of our last segment? The marriage of the Lamb. And we need to wear festal clothes. And here we're told how we get that clothing. Chapter 7 of Revelation, verse 13. One of the elders answers saying to me, these who are clothed in white robes, I mean, they look pretty, pretty white. Who are they and where have they come from? And I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation and they have washed 
their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know, I know many of us believe that we have good clothing. One, to those of you that think like that, the Bible has news for you. No matter how look good, you, good you think you look, you don't. You're naked. And some of us know we don't qualify. And, and we want to go far away from God because we say, well, I would never qualify. And you know, you're right. We would never qualify. Except that we are given festal clothes. We're given a white garment. This is the garment that actually Jesus purchased on the cross. It's his righteousness that is placed on us. And all of us that have washed our robes in the blood of the lamb have his righteousness placed upon us. See, this is what gives you the assurance of salvation, not your own past, Jesus' past, because your story is his story. Oh, I like that. Your story is his story and your story is history because the cross is history. Your salvation was actually gained for you 2000 years ago. And you can get that robe of his righteousness and live from this day forward with the assurance of your salvation. 